Kia ora tato. Uh, thank you, uh, and look, it's a real honour to be here with you guys today in this esteemed panel of ladies here on my left. Uh, ethnicity and enterprise. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm just going to kick off, give you a very brief intro to, to me and the work that we do, uh, and then I'm going to invite our panel to probably speak. I think we're tight for time, but um, if we can speak for maybe four to five minutes each, and then we'll aim for an interactive discussion. I'll ask some questions, invite you guys to ask some questions. Um, please, if you have any questions, start thinking of those as these guys speak. So uh, I've actually just got back from a month in the US. I was lucky enough to win a scholarship from the US Embassy and travel around with young leaders and entrepreneurs from 20 different countries around the world. So I literally just got back on Thursday last week um, and now have great friends from Burundi, the Gambia, Guinea, uh, Morocco, Egypt, Algeria, Cambodia, Poland, uh, Ireland, uh, the People's Republic of China. It's been an incredible trip. But great to be back home too, just reminded of how lucky we are to live in such a beautiful country, Aotearoa, New Zealand. So um, I guess a few years ago, as a young person, I just started learning about a lot of these big issues in our world and I found them really confronting and I just started asking what could I do? Uh, and over the last five years, it's been quite a journey setting up inspiring stories, an organisation with this big, bold vision to see every young New Zealander unleash their potential to change the world. Uh, we run an accelerator program developing young social entrepreneurs and their ventures and we've had about 100 alumni come out of that program over the last few years, including Pearl, who will speak shortly. Uh, we've, a lot of the stuff that we've done is more accessible for young people and more, I guess, in the urban centres. Uh, and I think there's a huge need uh, for opportunities for young people, particularly in some of our more rural and provincial areas across New Zealand. Uh, and so working in partnership with the Mayor's Task Force for Jobs to run a, a programme in seven more rural and provincial areas at the moment, which is exciting. Uh, and then we run a national film competition, which is about young people making a difference. Uh, and in a brief nutshell, uh, we've worked with about 5,000 young New Zealanders over the last five years. It's been an incredible journey, uh, and I'm humbled to be part of this panel and going to invite... Uh, oh, an interesting stat. Uh, there's about a million New Zealanders in our country aged 13 to 30 which is a quarter of our population. And for me, that's the, the big audacious goal. You know, what would it actually take to really empower and mobilise a, genera a generation of young New Zealanders to unleash their potential to change the world? Um, and that has to be a conversation about diversity and inclusion and accessibility for young New Zealanders to develop and grow their ideas and their skills too. So um, kia ora, that's enough from me for now. And I think um, I've been instructed to go uh, through our speakers, the order that your names come up in the program. So I think first up we've got um, Diane Dale from Taste of Lao. If you ladies could take the stage, if you can join me in giving them a, a warm round of applause. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much to the Human Rights Commission for inviting us along today. and We're very honoured to be um, a part of the programme and to share our story. Um, first of all, we'd like to ask whether it'll be okay for us to take a selfie with you. Is, is that alright? <laughs> yeah? Because that's what we do these days and we need it to document our journey. So we'd love you to be a part of that. Cool? Alright. <laughs> Dow doesn't really like this, but it's all right. <laughs> I make her do all sorts of things. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Okay, now my day's complete. So, um, Dow's gonna start first, and she's going to talk about the beginning of our journey and how we've come to be where we are today. So, here we go to you. Hi everyone, uh, thank you again for giving us the opportunity to speak today. Um, so we arrived in New Zealand in the early 80s as refugees with our parents. Um, I, was, I arrived in, the, in 1980, died a few years later. Um, I guess integrating into the New Zealand culture was relatively easy for us. We were quite young, uh, we started school, um, you know, made friends quite easily. And I guess um, out of the home, we would eat pies, fish and chips with our friends, come home, have rice. And I guess we got the, we got, um, the best of both worlds. Um, fast forward to our adulthood. Um, 
having children ourselves, there was a real need to um, carry that Lao food culture alive, especially for our children. And um, so, and we couldn't eat at our mum's house every day. So, <laughs> we decided uh, the the idea of a cookbook um, came up to kind of keep all the recipes alive. Um, but no one knew who we were back then. We didn't have any money, um, so it was really hard. Di was living in Melbourne at the time, so um, we started a food blog, and um, so that was mostly recipe-based. Um, we took pictures, posted it on Instagram, things like that. Fast forward a few years, 2014, there was an opportunity to um, apply for My Kitchen Rules. Um, light bulb moment, I thought, why not um, fast track um, the process and uh, introduce Lao culture, Lao food to all of New Zealand, introduce us to New Zealand. Um, so we applied. It was really hard. I was in Melbourne at the time, so we thought, why not give it a go? Um, yeah, and Di's going to talk a little bit about what happened afterwards. <laughs> So before we actually applied to enter the show, we were huge fans of My Kitchen Rules and me living in Melbourne and Dell living here in New Zealand at the time, we would catch up on a weekly basis and we would discuss um, the episodes they had been. So, you know, who made the best dishes, who got eliminated, and then would also say to each other, we could do a way better job than some of these contestants. And what do you know? The opportunity came up and we got on the show. Um, the first New Zealand Mike Kitchen Rules um, series, that is. Um, being on a reality cooking TV show and entering the world of film and media was a huge eye opener. And um, not everything is as it seems, obviously. So they manipulate a lot of things, things get taken out of context. But in saying that, we had a lot of fun and it was an experience of a lifetime. Um, we missed our families a lot because it meant that we had, to be, we, we had to be away from our families up to three months, to be exact. Um, but it was a small sacrifice to pay to follow our dreams. So for those of you who didn't get a chance to watch us while we were on My Kitchen Rules, um, let me tell you, we did okay. All right. <laughs> we, we made it to, to um, the semi-finals, so we came third equal. And even though we didn't walk away as champions and we didn't win, um, we were proud of what we had accomplished on the show because we cooked on the heart. We, we showcased our culture and we cooked food um, and we were able to um, introduce new flavours to the general public. And so we were able to still walk away with our heads held high. Um, so what does one do once they're eliminated from a cooking show? Well, you know, what's next? Well, like Dal said, one of the main things that we wanted to do was to start our own business in the food industry. And we knew that if we got onto a TV show, it would be the perfect launching pad for us um, to launch our product and to create brand awareness. And so in January 2015, we, um, we started up our own company, Taste Lao. Oh, hang on a I forgot to show some photos. <laughs> that was us when we were on um, My Kitchen Rules, and that was when we were um, in the midst, uh, we were in action, we were very stressed out at the time. Um, we were um, uh, doing our instant restaurant, and we were actually the f only team on the show where we got a 10 out of 10 for our mains. So, um, that was us doing our signature pork lap dish with sticky rice and um, a tamarind-based soup. Um, so yeah, in January 2015, we started our, our own company, Taste Lao, and Taste Lao is a, uh, we specialise in producing convenient and authentic Southeast Asian cooking sauces and marinades. And we're really proud that it's New Zealand made, and we're really also proud that we, um, we support other local um, businesses because we only use uh, fresh pro products, so we you know, source our ingredients from local farmers. Um, our products are currently available in, in, in nine locations, so more Wilsons here in Wellington and po Porirua, Plymouth and Delhi, Belmondo and Lyle Bay, um, Preston's on Hopper Street, 
uh, and NOSH food markets up in Auckland. And also, we've only just recently gone into New World in Hastings. We will be going into New World in Wellington soon. Um, of course, we've faced many challenges along the way, you know, what small businesses don't. Um, uh, you know, but these challenges only helped us to grow and to learn and to um, realise that uh, you know, this, is, this, is the, this is what we were meant to be doing. And um, you know, to top it all off, you know, we're busy mums and, and, and house, house um, wives and um, it, it sometimes takes a lot out of you, but you know, we manage. Um, so we're, we're very passionate about food and our Lao culture and our heritage and all we wanted to do was to share the flavours and our culture with New Zealand and eventually to the rest of the world. Um, and like what Deng Adut had said earlier in his keynote speech, um, don't listen to those who say no to you. Um, you are the only person holding you back. So don't hold back. And just to finish off, um, this is one of the greatest things about living in New Zealand is that it doesn't matter what race or ethnicity or background you come from, whatever goals or dreams you have in life, there are support networks and resources that can help you get to where you want to be. So to end that off, just we want to say a few words, just to stay true to yourself, uh, remember who you are and where you come from, ask for help if you need it. I keep forgetting, oh sorry, that's our products. <laughs> and never give up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diane Dell. Um, to save me running across the stage awkwardly and introducing each, each person, I've got a microphone. Yay! Um, you want to go up next, Pinnaman? Cool. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Pinnaman, who is the queen of the Africa Fashion Festival. Welcome to the stage. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, as Guy said, I'm Pinnaman. Um, I'm originally from Ghana. Um, I call New Zealand home now, although my parents live in Australia. So, Australia is my other home, but I call New Zealand is my home. So, um, I have a different story, but most of my story is quite similar to what Adarat would have shared with you today. Um, I came here to study um, at Auckland University as an international student. I could have gone to school in Australia, Sydney to be precise, but I chose um, New Zealand because I came here for a holiday, I loved it, and I had guardians, so I decided to stay with them and study here, finished um, studying, and instead of going back, decided to stay again. But in 2010, I went to Ghana, and I was also studying, I was um, vacationing in Australia and going back to Ghana a lot, and visiting my family. And I had an opportunity to move to the Ministry of Social Development to work in policy in 2010. And I was working in youth policy, developing policy for unemployment and getting young people to integrate and helping with young people who were not in education or employment, called NEET. Um, I, so when I went back to Ghana in 2010, it was just right after the recession and unemployment was really high, about 25%, although in New Zealand we were looking at about 7% unemployment rate. And in North Africa and Southern Africa, it was completely different, it was about 50%. So it, it challenged me as a young policy person from the continent, and my heart beats for Africa. I'm very passionate about the continent. Um, so I ended up at an economic forum where the government was talking about um, young people like myself who have been educated overseas, coming home, being a part, of Africa's future and development, and that really resonated with me. I came back very challenged. One of my passions, which friends have encouraged me over the years to pursue, it's fashion and art. But I thought I was incredibly smart, so I pushed that and I refused to live it because I have a look. So I can really associate with the stereotype and people judge me just how I look. Oh, you should be a model, you should be this, you should be that, and so I had to fight my love for the fashion and the arts and try and push the intellectual side of me of being a policy person and less of the art. But I thought, you know what, this is a great opportunity where the arts and culture um, industry in Africa is really booming. 
but there isn't enough infrastructure to support it. You love art, so why don't you come back and put what you're learning into practice? So I decided to create something called social enterprise, which is pretty much using business models, but focused on addressing social issues or an environmental issue. So for me, the social issues were um, supporting employment and development in Africa. So I decided to work with a bunch of designers to start this project. I have to figure this out. Um, I engage with a lot of designers and so the principles that we're working with is ethical fashion, sustainable fashion and job creation. So I only work with designers that sign up to really wanting to create an impact in Africa, working with artisans and providing high-end luxury pieces. So when I say Africa design, people are very quick to pull me into a, an ethnic niche market you know, like the costumes and stuff like that. So what I'm wearing is designed by one of our designers. The bag that you see there is a technique that I grew up called raffia bag. It's very traditional to Ghana, but working with one of our designers who went to Kingston University in the UK, which returned back home, working with artisans in the northern part of Ghana, pro pro uh, producing luxury pieces. And the same eyewear is also produced in Ghana from recycled wood. So. Um, and all because they are also equally passionate about creating jobs and supporting the development when walking the talk and going back. So I wanted to be a part of that journey and that led me to create um, this social enterprise called Agile, which is bringing African well, design into the Australasia region. So Agile stands for Africa, the D stands for design, and the J-O is literally the journey that I'm going on with this whole project of bringing the fashion and the art from the continent of Africa into Australasia. Australasia because this is where I live and this is where I travel to Japan, um, Korea and other parts. This is where I know I don't know North America very well. Um, so we have three platforms, Africa Fashion Festival being the reason why I'm here today, um, that most of you are aware of. And the other one is A Collective is working with a bunch of designers and trying to commercialise, help them get buyers and stockers in the Australasia region. Um, with Africa Fashion Festival, this is what I'm going to talk about. So. In, we've been working towards this. As you can see, it's not been an easy journey. I started this initiative whilst um, working full time as a policy um, analyst at the Ministry of Social Development and doing my master's in public policy and doing this part time. So this was literally like my baby, my life. This is, so it's, the meandering part of this whole thing shows the journey of engaging, having to make sacrifices, um, instead of hanging out with friends, I'll be at home trying, reading entrepreneurial books, figuring out what it is I'm doing and working with friends. Um, but I wanted to talk about Africa Fashion Festival today because the reason why I included this in um, was I had a lot of young African people coming up to me and asking me questions like, why are you so confident? How do you become so confident? It's not something I've actually thought about, but equally very, very shy and I've had to pull myself out and get out of my comfort zone. So when all those questions started coming to me, it made me think about my brother, who is quarter Tory straight, um, part um, European Australian and African, and his connection to the continent of Africa. I've been privileged to go back often, but my brother doesn't go back. And so I thought, well, how about my friends who are having babies who are half African and half European? What's their connection to their heritage? How can they have something that they celebrate? That is not what the media portrays. That is more luxury, beautiful pieces that these generation of Africans that are growing up can relate to. That is not the costume. There is a place for it, which I really respect because I value my culture. And it's the two worlds that have really molded me into who I am today. But have something that these young people can, it resonates with them. So we decided to pursue the idea of Africa Fashion Festival. Um, and alongside that, I launched a pilot mentoring program in conjunction with Ministry of Youth Development for five young people. So we paired them up with um, their mentors who were helping them either navigate in school, um, what, in terms of what they wanted to study, having that one adult that was interested in their life that they could talk to, who wasn't their family, who was a mom or dad. And Ty was talking about one of my mentors that really touched my heart was young Ethiopian boy. Um, 
He's never been to a restaurant before, but the beautiful thing is his mentor was a Tongan gentleman, and he was teaching him about football and sharing Ethiopian and Eritrean culture with him, and he was also teaching him about New Zealand cultures, and I think that we can always learn from each other, and we have to celebrate the great cultures, or I guess the values from the different cultures that we are quite privileged to, to have in New Zealand. So May this year, we had our first fashion festival, which was quite humbling for me. And I've had a lot of support along the journey. I've spoken to Guy, early morning meetings, um, before work. Um, I've um, had to network, get over my shyness, and get out there and network and meet people, um, go to seminars to educate myself in being an entrepreneur and being very passionate about giving back. Because a lot of investors are not interested in you know, addressing the social causes necessarily because that's my, that's what drives me, is creating jobs, but they want a return on their investment. So social enterprises are pretty new to New Zealand. In America, slightly different. You know, they've got the B Corps, so there is a greater awareness about it. But now social um, enterprises require what you call mission-driven investors, people who really believe in the cause of what you're doing, so they come on board for that. Um, so we launched through my hustle, and support of friends. Um, support of friends, we launched Africa Fashion Festival in May, which was well received. We had over 400 people, and a lot of the people that were at the festival are in this room, showing the high-end luxury pieces, but also what really touched me was the sense of community and having different generation of Africans, a five-year-old dancing around, taking photos of the artists who were performing or taking photos of models that were coming down the runway. And this is not what the Africa that most people get to see on TV. This is not the Africa that people think about. And I think all these were made in Africa, all these by young African people, highly educated, who are equally passionate about what they're doing. So I think that one thing that if I want to leave anyone with is not to have any stereotypes. We all have our unconscious our biases, but can you just put them behind? And as Adan said, you know, celebrate the humanity, get to know the person, and before you, I guess, you form your view. And in my journey, it's the stereotyping of being a woman and the sexism that I've had to face and, and to deal with alongside the, the racial um, challenges as well. But all in all, um, businesses have been very supportive of me. My network of friends have been incredibly supportive, um, connecting me and helping me out and helping me navigate some of the, even the challenges that I've faced as a young social entrepreneur. Um, so that's me for now. I can talk to a few other things <laughs> later on. Oops. Thank you, Penelope. Thank you, Pinnaman. Um, and it's been amazing to be a part of your journey bringing the Africa Fashion Festival to life too. Um, Pearl, up next. Uh, we've got about six minutes left, so Pearl, I'm going to challenge you to, to cut through right. in about four minutes if you can. Go for it. Don't worry, I'll be quick. I'll be quick. <laughs> so, um, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Pearl. I grew up in Sunny Hawks Bay. I come from this big bustling family where I've got like four strapping older brothers and a sassy younger sister. And... I'm Māori, I am Ngāti Kaungunu on my dad's side, and I am Ngāpui on my mum's side. I am a woman, and I am also a developer. Yeah, I, I build code, I make apps and software, and the amount of people that are openly shocked when I tell them this is mind-blowing, just absolutely crazy. Um, but I think about it, and it's actually, it, it's not a stretch. 80, 90% of the tech industry is male-dominated, and the, stere you know, the stereotype rings true for a reason. Now, I want to tell you a little story about airbags and cars. <laughs> now, when, in the late 80s, that they, they introduced airbags into cars, it was really unfortunate but many children and women died uh, in accidents. Even though the airbags deployed correctly, they, they were not designed for smaller statures. Now, the reason behind this was because all of the engineers who had designed these airbags, they were, they were all men, and they modeled 
the different crash dummies that they used in the simulations off male body types. Now this is one of the reasons why the tech industry also needs to diversify. Because who uses a phone here? Or the internet? Facebook? Google? Like you're basically seen as being like modern day illiterate if you can't email. And this is one of the important reasons why we need to diversify the tech industry. Because it's for everybody. Everybody uses technology. It has basically taken over our lives. And if we only ever have white guys building technologies for the entire world, we're only ever going to have products which are suited to white guys. Now, in January of this year, I did the incubator Live the Dream that Guy runs. And I created a uh, organization called Tech Tank. Now, at Tech Tank, I teach introductory classes to learn how to code and to become a programmer and a developer. And the intention behind creating Tech Tank was to make it more accessible for people to be able to learn how to code. I also wanted to be able to encourage a more diverse range of people to be able to have access to coding classes. So I really want to create a New Zealand tech industry that is really diverse, because diversity breeds innovation. And innovation and having a more diverse perspective in the tech industry means making world-class products. And I think as New Zealanders, we've already proven that we are world-class in many different areas. And I think that this is the area that we can set a standard for how the rest of the world should treat the technology industry. We can be the, at the forefront of the technology industry in the world. And considering the fact that it is seen that in the next five years that tech exports are going to be the biggest export out of New Zealand, there's so much, so many jobs, so much opportunity that is coming. The amount of money that will be coming into the economy alone is quite mind-boggling. but. This is an opportunity for us to be able to shape the future of the rest of the world. Thank you. Um, entrepreneurship's hard, you know. Uh, small, to in small to medium enterprises are the backbone of the New Zealand economy. 99% of startups fail within the first three years. Um, I think, hear it from these ladies, that you first and foremost have to be really passionate about the thing that you're trying to do um, and try and connect up with great people who can mentor and challenge you along the journey. Uh, kia ora. Thank you everyone for listening. It's been a great session.